Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is January 9th, 2013, and we have uh, some remixers and some people who are joining us at Educon. Um, Educon 2.5, I think it, it's called, in Philadelphia um, in a week or so. Um, and so George Mayo said, could I come on and talk about what we're going to be doing? And uh, Bill Fitzgerald is with us, and Harry Costner, and Monica Hardy, and Kelsey, and Scott Shellhart are with us as well. And people will kind of introduce themselves as, they, as we go. Um, you know what, if George, if you don't mind, we were starting with Bill, and so we'll go back to Bill. And Bill, introduce yourself. Tell us about Funny Monkey and what you've been up to recently and who you are and what you're planning <laughs> to do in Philadelphia. There you so, go. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Bill Fitzgerald. I run a, um, a shop called Funny Monkey here in Portland. We are an open source web development shop, and we work um, – Primarily with the education nonprofit organizations, but we also one of our kind of one of the things we work on internally. You know, we have some client work on this. But this is also part of our own internal development roadmap. It has to do with uh, open content and remixing that content. And the day before Educon, the Thursday, we are putting on the first of um, at this point three, but it looks like there are actually going to be a few more. On the on the calendar as as time goes by, the first um, is a community driven open content remixing event, and we're going to be bringing together basically as many teachers who want to show up, and we will just basically be having a structured workday to curate and uh, clean up and publish open content. Um, and we've been this is kind of work we've been doing on and off for various you know various projects over the last you know five six years. But one of the things that we are kind of focusing on more now is really making sure that the authoring experience is clean and working on distribution. And one of the things that we're building, um, again, fully open source, is a platform that people can use to author this content. And uh, when somebody writes, when somebody basically creates something in it, it is both accessible on the web in a site that's fully responsive, and it also is. Uh, Automatically generates a. <laughs> I just I just saw a second George pop in. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll figure that. <laughs> but uh, it, it also uh, automatically generates an email and a, uh, a document. So basically, you, uh, you you author it in one spot, and then you get something that'll work on the web, but is also fully adaptable to uh, any handheld device out there. Okay. Wow. Slow down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and other people, please slow him down, too, and, and, and interrupt us here. Start with open content, because, um, you know, we had Karen Fassenpower, and she's been on quite a bit recently, and she started to describe open licensed content to us. Um, can you give your spin on what open content is? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, and basically, yeah, Karen... Um, can, 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 can Karen's version goes. I mean, we could actually probably just skip what I was going to say and go to... Gonna go to her version of it because she's uh, but uh, yeah no I mean she's she's uh she's rock solid when it comes to this. Um, there there really there's no difference between open content and only okay. licensed content. Um, the only uh, really what it refers to is any kind of resource that you can that you can create um, often for often for classroom use often for just uh, informal um, informal learning if you want to uh, if you want to support that. But you license it in such a way where it's possible to remix it, reuse it, recontextualize it, and redistribute it. So the idea is you basically create a, a resource once, and you will you basically then you release it out there so anybody else who wants it can grab it and reuse it as they need it and as they say as they see fit. Um, Creative Commons licenses are generally designed to do that. Um, I don't know if we want to get into different flavors of Creative Commons licensing here, but uh, when when I say open content, anyways, I I tend to mean content that is released in the, in a reusable format and licensed under a license that allows reuse, remixing, and redistribution. Okay, so that's a good introduction. We'll get back around maybe on some of that. Yeah, and 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 so. 
you're doing that the Thursday before Educon, and then you have a a conversation at Educon as well. Is that right? Yeah, actually, yeah, we have um, so. We have the event at Educon. We also have two other events that are coming up in the uh, in the spring. One is in uh, Portland, which is where I'm at, and the second is um, in San Francisco. Um, and these are both both community events. Right now, there's possibly a fourth that's going to get added, um, but we're still kind of sorting out the details on that. Okay. I mean, so, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, really, what we're what we're hoping to actually see develop here is a series of community-driven, community-led remixing events, where really any any interested party, uh, but it would be great to have as many teachers as want to show up, get together to remix and curate open content because there's there's a lot of good resources out there. A lot of it's openly licensed, but it is not in a format that is really well suited to reuse. And these are some of the things we're going to talk about in our Educon session. So, yeah, so you you were right next to a question I wanted to ask before we get to George and Harry, which is why should why should why is this important? It, and it is just what you just said, but maybe say that again. Um, yeah. Well, I have a couple questions. Like, why yeah. why why should I be so concerned <laughs> that it's open? Why can't I just use anything? You know, free free. Uh, uh, access to stuff and and then like what, what what's the need <laughs> you know well, it, I mean the, yeah. the the simple answer is that you know if 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 learning was a one-off then yeah just just use something free don't worry about it but learning isn't a one-off learning is kind of it's a constantly iterative process and when we start modeling this as educators when we start modeling a way of working together to generate the tools and the means that we use to learn and teach. And we do this in a way where it is constantly evolving to adapt to the needs of our classes. At that point, our curricular materials and our resources start to be part of the model of what we want learning to look like. It's a much more... Um, it involves a, I mean, it, it definitely requires a higher level of involvement than just cracking open a textbook and throwing out a worksheet. But in my opinion, that's, that, that's a good thing. And that's what we should be moving towards. The other, the, the other reason why, I mean, there, honestly, I mean, I could, I could sit and talk for kind of this, you know, this hour, and then we could tack on three or four more in, in answering this question. <laughs> but the other, uh, the other, the other piece of this is the other reason why this matters is there's a lot of talk right now about how teachers should really just be people who deliver a scripted curriculum, and this is a way of demonstrating why that is an awful idea, because this is something that highlights the expertise of teachers, gives them control over and a direct voice in what is happening in their classroom. It has the potential to give students a voice in developing and co-writing that curriculum. It's a way of basically drawing a series of successively clear lines in the sand about what we want teaching and learning to be and having those lines in the sand themselves be, be reusable. So again, I mean, if, if, if you view education as essentially a product that you can acquire, then open content isn't for you. If you view education as a process which is evolving and really never ending and can be improved iterative, iteratively, then open content is something that will that will be of interest to you. Great, um, very detailed introduction. Um, we'll come back and hear why it's going to be fun too. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not promising fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <All right>. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I can okay. do and, 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 and I can do long I can do long witted and bombastic. I don't I don't do fun. Oh come on. <laughs> um, George George and Harry, why don't you guys describe what you have in mind and then we'll see if there's uh what you know, what kind of conversation we can build here. All right. Um I just want to introduce jump in really, yourself first, yeah. Because... You don't mind here, I want to say something really fast about um Please. Bill because I was I'm really curious about what Bill's doing and I wanted to go to um, Educon on the day before, but it was before I took a week off from being sick. That now it makes it trickier to get off. <laughs> but um, it's because I'm I'm I got this I'm moved from middle school to high school this year. I'm teaching uh, this film class. There's no curriculum for it, so I've been writing a putting a curriculum together as I go through the year. 
Yeah. And I got, I've got it all on right now on a private wiki because it's kind of a mess. You know? Yes. And, and it's kind of tricky because you like, I'm like, like I put a movie, movie review together and everything that you do, and I'm assuming this is kind of true for a lot of teachers, you, you, you go online and you're looking for stuff and you grab something from here, you grab something from over there, you, you put your own stuff in. And sometimes I feel a little guilty and I'm trying to kind of put sources on the bottom like I got this from here and yeah. it, all gets, it's, it all gets kind of mixed up. But I mean at the end of the year I'm hoping that I'll have like a full year kind of map basically that I can then share. And then and then tweak and kind of you know you don't do the same thing every year but like you kind of just have like this year I have nothing and I'm just you know so yeah. I was really curious in your thing and I I still I'm gonna try to go just because I would love to hear what you say and and, and the structure and and the, and the tips for putting it together you know and and one thing I think is really really useful of this is getting potential feedback from other people on what you've created I know Paul's done a lot of this stuff um, mm -hmm. with Youth Voices where they had multiple teachers creating curriculum and sharing. Uh, and there's a lot of that on the Youth Voices site. For uh, it just seems like just getting the feedback alone and seeing what other people do with you know what projects are how you yeah. them and stuff. What it, let's let's definitely talk at Educon because you again what what you just described is exactly the use case we're building this for. Hmm. Again, because how how many other teachers in your building are doing something very comparable to what you've done? <clears throat> they have either a full year or a partial year that is in pretty good form. And with some focused attention with, with, with a group of people working on it, it could be set up into something that is reusable in a variety of different contexts. Yeah. Maybe not the whole thing, but maybe two weeks worth, maybe a day's worth. But that's where that reuse will never happen if it's on a private wiki. But right. that reuse will start to happen when it's released out really in, in any format openly licensed. So, yeah, yeah let's, let, let's talk at Educon and, just, and make that happen, and we can document what that looks like. Because I've taken some, I get like these big files from other teachers. I'm teaching an English class, and I'll come and literally like print one of everything and lay it out across my basement <laughs> floor, and then it's just like crazy making. Because I'm like, Sh yeah. shit, how, put all this, just you know, I don't know. It's not in a format. I mean, you get stuff from people and often, and it's not in a format that is usable almost because it's like just spread out everywhere. But I, Harry, you want me to go? You want to start off? Well, explain. Okay. I had two questions for Bill also on my end, two questions. Um, one was an idea that I had heard bantied around that might be connected to your, your idea is um, students kind of remixing and creating their own textbook from like a larger open sourced material, kind of um, where they're designing it around their learning styles and things like that. Is that sort of in your wheelhouse to kind of individualizing a student's approach to like the, the normal textbook and things like that? Yes. Okay, awesome. And because um, I think that's really exciting, you know, students being able to design their own methods of studying. But secondly, I had a question because I do a lot of from the ground up curriculum also. I was always curious, when you work for a school system, and I know I realize you're not a lawyer, but, um, you know, how <laughs> much of the content that you create when you're employed by, say, a public school is really owned? Like, I I'm just curious how that works. Like, I've developed a curriculum over 10 years that is cool and I'd love to share. I don't know if, say, my school system has rights to what I'm doing or if they would have a problem because I wanted to create ebooks, you know, just put yep. them out there with my stuff. Like, here's an ebook on this teaching media literacy. But have you run into this issue or, or, well, or what is it? This is so there, and, and again, I, I, I am not a lawyer. Um, I, I have talked about, actually, I've talked about this a fair amount actually with our lawyers at Funny Monkey because this is something we've researched as an open source development shop. This is also something that I've talked about with other people within um, both the public school and independent school world. Um, this is less of an issue in higher ed. A lot of it has to do with your, with the way your actually uh, your contract is structured. Um, and also a lot of it has to do with, with when you have written this. Um, if you are writing this at night, you actually have a valid claim that that's your time. Um, some schools, some school systems have actually, and this is actually within uh, independent schools, and in my, my personal opinion, this is a horrible property grab that completely misses the point of what teaching and learning should be. Um, and my attitude on this is to really, basically, if there's, if there's a gray area, you are, I think, well within your rights to claim fair use over your intellectual property and release it under the license that you see fit. If your school wants to generate the publicity of suing a creative teacher, 
um, they <laughs> they are welcome to really go down that road. That I'm that'll be fun, um, and then you can retire on your book profits as you write about it afterwards. Um, it just seems like there's also this big push of this edupreneur stuff. Like everybody wants to capitalize on what they're doing and somehow make money off it. I just see. I mean, Twitter is just nothing to me, but this edupreneur. Yeah. Like, how do I leverage my teacher coolness I, into making money? <laughs> I, I just I just threw up my mouth a little bit when you said the term edupreneur. Um, right. But it wasn't. No, I mean, I mean, and, and actually, you, yeah. yeah, you're definitely there. There is that. Um, the term edupreneur is, in my opinion, horribly misplaced. I, I actually put out a blog post a couple of years ago, uh, um, the the myth of the edupreneur, because um, yeah, it's it's a it's a complete bullshit term, in my opinion. Um, not that I have opinions about it, but uh, <laughs> but it, and at the end, if somebody is looking to get rich off of content, please let please let them try. But really, it's it's about supporting process. Open content is about empowering people within a community as they are working through a process of creating useful resources. Really, and end, end of story. If there are resources that you've created, I would, especially if you've done them over 10 years, that's that's your work. That's your creative output. Like if you if you wrote a book, if you wrote a, a novel during that same time, that's your creative output. So right. the, these are things that you have done that you that you control over that you have control over. I would, I would feel well within your rights to use them as you see fit. Keep that. Keep in mind, like I, I have skin in the game, getting more stuff open, and I'm not a lawyer. So you guys, you guys are really fast on this. I gotta say, um, I want to invite, I want to invite Kelsey and Scott and Monica to, um, and myself to, to jump in and ask any questions at this point that you might have or thoughts or. Even if you're like, what did you just say? Or, you know, anything that's on your mind. <laughs> Kelsey, you have anything on your mind, or what are you up to? Is this hard to follow? It's a little different tonight. <laughs> yeah. He keeps talking about remixing, but I don't really know what that is. Like, what comes to mind is music, and I think it has kind of something to do with that same idea, but I don't really know how that works. That's a good, that's a good uh, shoot off. That's great. Yeah. Anybody want to handle that? How's this? How? What's any of this do with remixing? <laughs> George. <laughs> what? We don't hear you, George. I'm sorry. Hey, we, we can, now we, you're on. We can talk a little bit about maybe I, I can bring in what our plan is for Etucon and um, what I. So um, you're Kelsey, right? Mm-hmm. Kelsey. So we have this idea for uh, Etucon, and, and Harry will pick it up soon because it was his idea. Where um, basically he he got the idea. I guess Harry, I should let you explain it. You you were at your school, and there was something going on in your school, and they asked you to document it. You said basically, you know, I'm only one person. I, if, if everyone else kind of helped me document it, we we would get a better idea on on what was going what was going down. Do you want to? Oh yeah, I'll I'll just briefly yeah. So basically, I'm the guy that goes around and tapes events. But I thought if parents, kids, and everyone who have these new empowered sort of smartphones were documenting all at the same time, we would have amazing different points of view, we would have things that I would never think to take, and it would create a, a body of work or a video or an output that would be ten times more interesting than if I was just walking around the school. So we did that experiment and it worked really well, and we're trying to bring this concept to Educon where everyone who comes will have the ability to contribute the ingredients. So, uh, so speak to you. So, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to tell that story a little bit more detail. So what was the event and how many videos did you get and how did you get them together? Okay, so it, just really, I'll, really simply, there's an event every year called Celebrate Gunston, which is an event where we celebrate all these things that go on at the school. Each teacher showcases work and there are plays and music performances, so it's a lot of stuff. So what we did was we created a Gmail account, and people were able to, on their cell phones, um, send pictures from their experience, send video, and then we got a Google Voice number where you could actually call and talk about what you're experiencing or record sounds from the event. And so in through this Gmail and now the Google Drive, I had this amazing resource of, you know, 
50 different pictures, lots of video, and people recording sounds that I could then produce different things with that ingredients. So sort of to me, if I were to speak to the remix, it's kind of like taking ingredients and, and, and uh, in, in some terms of making a cake, but not specifically saying what that cake could become. So you're, you're taking ingredients and more of this, less of this, and you're remixing it and creating original stuff. Um, lots of different ingredients or resources. So in this case, audio, video, and um, and pictures and images. Does that make what sense? This, yeah. Go ahead, Kelsey. What it, what it kind of reminds me of is those pictures where it's a bunch of little pictures, but if you put all the little pictures together and look at them all together, they're one bigger picture. Ah, I love that analogy. See, that's that that's that's great. That is really great. I completely agree. I mean, we're hoping that we're going to have this Google Drive at Educon filled with amazing resources and different things and pictures that will be exciting to remix, use, look at, experience. So, so and bring, bring, bringing Bill back into this question, what I what I quickly imagine is a mess. <laughs> you know, what yeah, what it, yeah, it, it, it is a mess, yeah, and and but, that's yeah. and and that's actually that's the mess we want, because one again one person's mess is another person's found art, mm -hmm. and this is where, and Kelsey, getting getting back to your question, like how it's how it's like music, you know, when you uh, when you when you sample it when you sample a track into a new song, that new song changes the way you understand the track. Same thing with uh, with same 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 thing with content. You know, you can you can actually remix pieces of a lesson and create connections that wouldn't be there ordinarily. So you have, if you think of basically all of the things that you encounter in in your day, whether that's a school day or whether that's a work day, as building blocks to tell a story. When you remix those building blocks in a different order or bring in new influences, you can create a different story that might make more sense in a different context. So really what it's about, it's, it's about the ability to basically pick and choose what you want to use to tell a specific story at, at a specific time. And the remix aspect is more just a reflection that there's a lot of good information that's already out there. So you don't need to reinvent everything from scratch, but you can, again, find something from, you know, from one corner, find something from another corner, add something new on top of it to hold it together in a different way, and off you go. And it's that ability to kind of recycle and recontextualize in a way that basically creates something new or different than what was already there. Does that does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was um I'm sorry, Paul. No, I was gonna ask Kelsey, not not that you have to represent your generation, but do you or your friends do that <laughs> anywhere? <laughs> I'm making fun of myself a little bit there, but do you, do you remix? Do you know anywhere? I can't really think of a specific occasion, but it does sound like something that we would do. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Another thing this brings to mind is like taking a panorama with a normal camera, where you take all the pictures and then kind of combine them into one picture of the same thing, just bigger. Did you see the picture of Obama's first inauguration where they took all the pictures from all the different angles and mashed them all together? Mm -mm. You have to check that out. It's, it's, it's different perspectives of the same event. Okay. George, go ahead. Sorry. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. And so w w one thing we were, because I've been curious about this with the, the structure that, that we're going to use to do this, because in my mind, like, um, that, that's the thing, like, you know, you get all this content, hopefully we'll get, hopefully people will have buy-in and we'll actually have a problem of getting a lot of content submitted, but like we were, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, well, Flickr would be an obvious choice, right? You do a Flickr pool and then the, the people upload pictures, but Harry made a good point. We were looking at it last night, we were talking about it, and the Google folder is more dedicated for like a remix tool. Because it's just odd, there's only one click. If you see the picture that you want, you just click download and you download it. Whereas with Flickr, you know, there's multiple clicks. And so, like, the idea is that we're creating, you know, not like, I like Harry made this distinction last night. Flickr is where you go and you look at photos, right? What we're doing is trying to just post up all these different photos in that Google fo folder or whatever it is. You know, people can just say, oh, I want it, and they can grab it just like that, where it's just, you know, one click and they have it. And, and, and to go back to remixing, like I know when I do film in the classroom, and I did it in middle school, there's always, 
some magical things that can happen when you start combining different types of media. And I know there's always this moment when kids are first learning how to make films. And it happens to, to me all the time, you know. You drop in a piece of music behind like an image, or you drop a piece of music in behind somebody just talking, and it just clicks and it works. And so if you start kind of combining these things, or you get teachers maybe at Educon to start doing, and this is another point of doing this, is just getting teachers to kind of play around with this stuff, to see how different media can mix with, you know, mix and what happens when you start to do that. But it's really cool. I mean, you, you even just taking, um, uh, you know, different, we, we were going to have to try to try to get people to call in um, uh, digital um, thoughts, you know, and send it to the, to the, to the Google folder, and we we're going to post them all as little MP3s. Even grabbing some of those and kind of, you know, cutting it, like even in, in GarageBand or Audacity, and looping it and adding it to like a soundscape. I mean you can just start to create and, and what we're trying to do is we, our strategy is like not that we have a bunch of remixes all about you know um, necessarily all education related. We're hoping that it's it's also cre creative like we're trying to get people just to take this stuff and do some interesting and creative things that maybe it's not related to education at all. Maybe most of them will be. I mean so we're, we're just kind of making this content available. I mean SLA is in a cool, it's an interesting part of town. I mean, I know I walk from the hotel there and oftentimes it's cold and there will be, you know, uh, office buildings and that, that heat smoke coming up in the morning and, and it's, it's, it's pretty and it's nice and you can get shots of that and shots of inside and shots of the school and shots of people talking. I mean, potentially there's a lot of content there that would be fun to play with, you know. And are you guys going to have like a PlayStation and down in the cafeteria during the day? <laughs> yeah, we would love to, man. I mean, that, that's a great idea. That's a really good no, idea. You, you should totally do that. <laughs> yeah. what, would the, what would that look like? You... I think just a bunch of people with computers and kind of looking, wow, have you seen this one? I'm trying this one. I have this tool. Have you tried this? You know, hey, I'm dropping this beat in. I, I've, I've looped this. And, and just people who are actually trying to, to, to download some stuff and, and use it. Because it's not about just, that's another thing. It's not about just posting it. It's about posting it and, and downloading it and, and trying to kind of create something. It doesn't have to be. It's not complicated, you know. Like it's, uh, it's not something that has to be complicated. It shouldn't be complicated for our purposes, anyway. Can, um, okay. Would it be okay to ask a question of something that was on my mind about our project to the general population here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So we have this Google Voice, and you can call this phone number and leave a voicemail of anything you want that will be available. My thought last night when I was talking to George is, would this be interesting? Is you would take what you would perceive to be your most interesting tweet that you would automatically just tweet, but you instead of tweeting it, you would actually uh, use your voice to record it as a voice message. So you would, it would be, I think it would be interesting to hear people that you usually follow on Twitter, but you would hear their voice reading it, and it would have some sort of interesting meaning or power, or it, it would just add a different element. And I was wondering if, if you guys thought that might be interesting to hear kind of an actual verbalized uh, tweet thing, or is that kind of just random and strange? Um, a Facebook post maybe, or something a little longer, but something as short as a Twitter post, I don't think you can really relate the passion anymore with your voice than you can with the text. Right. Well, then maybe it's the idea is the the main idea of your tweet, or we could put a limit on it. But just I'm thinking of people like Will Richards and all you know, stage or all these people, like what their voice would sound like as they're you know reading their 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 ideas into this collective consciousness of you know people that I've seen. But yeah, you're probably right. The, the tweet is too short, but maybe the concept is good. I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I like the idea. It just needs tuned a little bit. What what about getting a uh, what about basically aggregating a like the Educon hashtag and having a screen reader read it out and you could ask you just kind of sample you know kind of, you could have different voices coming through and you could sample those voices. Um, I mean I I I, 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 got, I would not shy away from different or weird at this point. I I think you could have, you could actually have a lot of fun with that. Right. But uh, and I I mean I would you know given what you I would experiment with some text to speech stuff. And see how you could uh, make that make that work. I mean, there are a lot of in-browser tools that could do that, but then you could just record some stuff, and it could add it would it would add some interesting texture to it. I don't think it would carry over as well with text to speech because I don't know if this is what you were actually getting at, but what I was thinking is kind of hearing the pretty much writer 
like the personal spin and the feeling behind right. it. And I don't think you could get that through text. And having a text to speech, I think you would still lose that. Right. I, that's exactly what I'm getting at. You know, I, you know, I was looking at my Twitter feed. You know, every person that's on there, what their voice would sound like. I just think that has that adds a unique kind of vibe, if you will, like you know, how they would say it, sort of spoken word vibe, if you will. I think with the group you're going to be with, they'd get a kick out of that. All right, cool. And I, I think, you know, what um, Bill said, I mean, you're doing remix. Well, why would you draw lines about what's crazy and what's not? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and did you see the thing a couple years ago with uh, Roger Ebert where he couldn't speak anymore, but they used samples of his voice to let him talk again? It might have even been on a TED Talk, and the, the technology's improved quite a bit on that. It wouldn't be too difficult to get somebody who's done a lot of public speaking and do that same thing, somebody like a, a Will Richardson or a Paul or somebody that we've got a lot of their voice recorded already. Interesting. So, Bill, the, the, uh, you mentioned an authoring tool that you're going to introduce on Thursday. I think, uh, yeah, okay. and then and then as you were talking, it, it ended up in a um, in a mobile device. Can you kind of retrace some of that? Like, what's that authoring tool going to look like? And and can these guys use that to to help organize some of this? Or yeah, uh, so what we're what we're building is in basically it's an open source authoring platform. Um, it's web based. Um, we'll be having an install profile for it, so anybody who wants it can grab it. Um, we're still actually building out some of the uh, some of the UI components, some of the user interface components, um, and we are for Educon. We're targeting just basically a really a really simple kind of stripped down version of it, and we're also going to be um, kind of getting a roadmap in place. Our our goals for it. Um, you know, medium term, you know, shortly after Educon will be basically full data portability. So anything that's created in one platform can be pulled to another. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to get that nailed down by, by Educon, but that'll be coming shortly, shortly I, down the road. I didn't understand that. What's the problem and, and what's the solution there? Full data portability. <laughs> so basically you, uh, you, you create something in this site? Because you, uh -huh. you know how when you, uh, again, you... You go to Facebook. You write something in Facebook. It's it stays in Facebook. It's stuck there. Right. Even even if you wanted to pull it out, it would be difficult to do. Um, that's not something that we want to have happening with curricular resources. We want them to be easy easy to pull out, easy to reuse. So um, yeah, I gotta say, even Google Drive, it's hard to pull out the yeah. the audio from that. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you can download it, but yeah. Um, so. The, uh, the pieces that we will have in place for Educon will be the core authoring platform. And anything that you author in there will also be immediately available. It'll get um, basically parsed and rendered as an EPUB, so you can read it within iBooks. And you can also, it'll also get automatically parsed into a Mobi format, so you can read it on a Kindle. Um, the site itself is also fully responsive, so it'll if you have a web-enabled device, really any any smartphone with an internet connection, the content will be accessible there. And we've been uh, doing a fair amount of work behind the scenes to make that so users don't need to think about it; it'll just work. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. <laughs> Sorry. So, and and the big purpose of this is so that people can remix and make their own textbooks. Yes. <laughs> that was I got it right. No. <laughs> what do you mean? So Wait. Paul, can I can I say yeah, something? Yeah. So the, the 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 thing you pointed out about the, the audio and the Google Drives, we've already seen that problem because you can't mm -hmm. play. Um, yeah. You can see the image images and you can see video. It's perfect for that. But for audio, what we're going to do is actually have we're going to have SoundCloud. We're going to take all the audio files, put it into the SoundCloud link, uh, and tag it or something. So that will be easily accessible and easily downloadable. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask Bill, um, as you're hearing about what we're doing, is there anything like that that struck you about like a, the structure or like a way of, of pulling this off as far as like project the structuring like the way that the tools we're using? No, I mean the uh, I was I was thinking about that as you were talking. Actually, I mean I think that having 
having a stripped down t- toolkit that's easily accessible is definitely definitely the way to go. And it, and I, I think you have that. Um, the one thing I would look at is I know on on a Google Voice number you can get that emailed um, to you, and it'll it will include the attachment. If it will be possible to automate basically set up SoundCloud to receive those emails and create that automatically. That would be a way to, uh, a way to um, simplify that. If it's, I know that you can email stuff into a Dropbox and if SoundCloud can harvest from Dropbox, you might need to use a third party thing there. But I would look at kind of what SoundCloud could accept. So you are not having to manually um, touch the, uh, the incoming voicemails. What do you think about the the Google the Google Drive folders when they if they fill up? Like I wonder if you, and and again you know this is a you know if we get buy in from this, you know hopefully we will. But if you get say if you even got you know sixty pieces sixty images and, and pieces of video on one Google Drive, like we we're not even sure what that would would start to look like if it would become. You would, would you ha- you know look at twenty and then have to scroll an arrow to like the, a next page of, or would it just list them all like straight down like these are. There's a, there's some there's some definite unknowns. <laughs> yeah, I am I'm, I'm not familiar enough with Google Drive to know for sure. My initial impression is that that would be a wonderful problem to have. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. I mean, if if that's something that like when if and when that problem exists, solve it. Um, but up until that point, I wouldn't I wouldn't over engineer any any solution here. I would keep yeah. it as as light as possible. Yeah. So I. I, I, I I want to keep it real for a second <laughs> somehow. So <laughs> this sounds like fun, and I, I can kind of uh, make sense of it uh, as a learner. Um, Kelsey's eighth in eighth grade. A teacher in her in her school wants to learn from this experiment. What what happens in his his or her class that's different? In other words. Who, is is Kelsey or another student going to be able to use this process in I some way? That yeah. How I use it is on a field trip for sure. So kids are taking their cell phones on the field trip. They're all documenting their experience and emailing it back to the teacher's box, and then together they can look at what everyone documented. So it's kind of a. That's how I look at it anyway. Mm-hmm. Where, um, it would be valuable to get everyone's um, artistic impression on anything that's going on at school. Um, so that that's sort of how I would relate it. Yeah. It'd also be a really good way of teaching about Creative Commons copyright law as well. Yeah, really we're going to do that with our cell phone policy. Way of getting kids to think about copyright. I mean, they're creating all this stuff and uploading it and sharing it, so they'd be tagging it under the type of CC license that would make it... Um, Adaptable, or you know, whatever license would apply. Be a good way to teach CC licensing. Kelsey, were you going to say something, or I don't think we'd be able to do that. Like, our school says they do stuff with technology. I mean, we have Promethean boards, but our <laughs> cell phone policy makes it kind of difficult to do anything like that. We can't have cameras, can't have cell phones. So I think that would make it a little difficult in my case. And Kelsey, why don't why don't you ask them how how they can define Promethean boards as technology, and why don't they let you use real stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm just never mind. <laughs> Monica, can I can I maybe um, push your button a little bit? You've you've talked about collecting like a brain, <laughs> can you, and and you've been working on some sort of mobile device, right? Can you does this relate to your project at all, or can you maybe tell us where that is? Yeah, only I can check. Those are me. Well, everything's the same, right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, the thing that's resonating with me out of the whole conversation is um, the remix is modeling a perpetual beta ness that I think is missing because of our efficiency that has been bred into us into the public school system. And so I love that. Um, I, I still have trouble with um, copyright law and who owns what. I mean, who's to say who owns what? So again, I like what they're, what you guys are doing because um, that's, that's how it should be. You shouldn't have to ask if you can share <laughs> stuff, you know. Um, that should just be a done deal. It should be out there. Um, so love the project because it's modeling what's 
greatly missing, that we live in perpetual beta. We're not the same now as we are five minutes from now. Um, how it relates to what we're doing, um, we're, one of the things I think Paul is referring to is you're trying to create an app um, that would um, facilitate and crowdsource curiosities so that we get rid of the compulsory prescribed curriculum and we just focus on curiosities, which like the mess that you guys are perceiving, it would be, you know, uh, um, a, me a chaos that we want by design, actually. So, but so I think the tech would help ground that chaos. What, so uh, say those two words again, curate and do what with curiosities? Facilitate and curate. Facilitate. Um, well, I, actually, I said facilitate. So that's about connecting people. Source. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, the, the time period between when you decide what matters to you and you find your people. That's what the app, the main purpose of the app is to hasten that time, shorten that time period. So we feel like that's when we get people that don't care about what they're doing quite so much. And if we could, if we could shorten that time period, I think all the perceived chaos and fear that people would just be all over the place and not get anything done, people would see that, oh, it's doable today. Um, so. Or, or actually kind of articulating and demonstrating that an ebb and flow between more order and less order is a good and natural way of doing it. And that's where, you know, if you think of the remixing process as, as a series of waves and any, any, any one piece of delivery is, again, it's a, it's a crest on the wave, but then it's broken down and it's remixed and it's reused in a different way. Like that's, that's a different way of thinking about learning than what we usually see and what we ordinarily see. And that's what's nice about what um, George and Harry are doing is that, you know, again, you guys are providing basically a repository a repository for thoughts that are tied together by, you know, by virtue of being about a single event, but can be remixed alongside whatever the remixer wants to bring in. And I think that having that model and having that as a, yeah, really as a, as like a PlayStation, like they would look like a bunch of people sitting around staring at computer screens, laughing every once in a while. Like that's not a bad model for what some types of learning can look like. We're going to have to try to think about setting one of those up, um, Harry, because that's a great idea, a, a PlayStation. And I love what Monica said, per perpetual beta. That's a great phrase. Right. Like I mean, I, I hope that, I mean, my challenge to everyone would be to try to learn one new thing using this material. I mean, it could be a tool, a Web 2.0 thing. It could be a new software. It could be an experiment. It could be Photoshop. Just take this stuff and, and learn something new like using these ingredients and and that's what I would hope and I'm gonna you know hold myself to that hopefully and and, and try something new what about what about people who aren't in Philadelphia will they that's, be able to access some of this or right that's the beauty of the Gmail so I would love for them to take a picture of them tuning in and what their environment is like and sending it to the big place so that's why it's all funnels to one area which that's great. I mean, that, that would be perfect. Yeah, because I, I thought about that, that as well. Um, you know, all the people that are tuning in, because there's quite a few people who kind of tune in, and they, and they make it so accessible. I think I don't, um, they, they broadcast every session, and, and so that, that would be also really cool if the people that are watching via online can take the content. I mean, they're all going to have, it's all, you know, it's accessible to everyone. And the idea that, I didn't think about that, though, that people that are online and watching different sessions, you know, they may take content as well and, and post it and, and play right along. So it's one big experiment, I guess, as Harry and I have been telling ourselves. Kelsey, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Myself. We okay. were talking, like, Dad said Perpetual Beta would be a good name for a band. And then... <laughs> Bill brought up a band called the Beta Band, and they have a song called Dry the Rain. And then Dad said it sounded like it need, needed remix. Bleh, remix. And then I said also it needs more cowbell. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so where are we, guys? <laughs> <laughs> So, 
I, I have a I have a, a, a nagging question. I'll, I'll ask it. <laughs> one of the one of the um, one of the issues I have with with some of the remix stuff from a writing point of view is that I have a I have too many students who create research papers, right? I mean, they're, they're not invested in them, so I don't know how much this matters. But they don't have a good process for writing. So what they do is they go on the web, find something, copy it, change it around a little bit, and call it theirs, right? And, it's, and, and then they just sort of aggregate all that stuff together. And, and it doesn't make sense in the end. That's a uh, that's that's a process yeah. in a second draft issue as opposed to a remix issue though. I mean that's where learning learning the skills to, of remixing well, learning citation, um, learning also how you uh, how you want to structure what you want to say. These are all critical thinking skills that are required to do anything, um, in, including remixing, but not limited to remixing. And if you don't have those basics, you're not going to be able. Again, I mean these sound like research skills that. They kind of crop up as they are as they're doing work, as opposed to things that are, you know, inherently problematic with with remixing. I mean, I think the fact that you can cut and paste large volumes of information makes these problems kind of mushroom faster. But that's certainly not a uh, not something new to you know kind of the current day. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm wondering I'm wondering it from a process perspective, like. Is it better? I mean, it's not better, I guess, but I'm more familiar with starting with your own heart, your own head, your own thoughts, right? And then folding in other people's thoughts. Whereas I think young people are more familiar with starting with other people's thoughts, and then I worry that they don't get to their own thoughts fast enough. Like, I'm not, I'm not so sure I love remix culture. If you give, the, give, the, give, the, give me a day, and I'll have a blog post out about that. Literally, I was—I've been working on it over the past few days, and that's one of the things that it talks about because the the starting point is ideally your vision, your scope, your definition of what you want to create, and you define that first. And in some cases, you actually even go and like start sketching out your structure for it. So that's your that that's your initial rock, and that's that's the place you go back to. And yeah, and if you don't have that rock. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and, and if you, and again, that's that's why it's a process issue and not a remix culture issue. If people don't, again, if people aren't, again, I mean, if people aren't told that, yeah, your primary responsibility is to create what you want to create when you want to create it, they're not going to do it. Um, and I mean, and I think that that, that in and of itself is, is I think, uh, a bigger, more systemic issue is that a lot of times people are evaluating learning as doing well on the test instead of defining what it is you want to accomplish. And those are two fundamentally different tests. Yeah, and Paul, I think the, the remix can be a, a very good catalyst or a good starting point for people to be very creative, but in today's environment, a lot of times they don't have the time to see it to the end. It's They play around, they find something, they remix, they mash a few things together, and they really get going, and then it's for either their reasons or they're forced to, they have to stop that process and start on the next thing. I think in this fast-paced remix, smash together culture, the board's just not. There's not enough wait time to let it percolate a little bit. Hmm. I, I think I have this problem in my class also, but I think that you just have to re-evaluate assessment, where students have to defend that they have created something unique and new, and that that culture of did you push an idea, did your collective, did your collection bring an idea um, clear or did it create something new has to be there and that pressure to not just put a bunch of things together and call it your own sandwich <laughs> makes that happen you know and I think assessment you have to defend the work it's no longer uh, it can't stand on its own the people who create it have to be able to speak on it at least that's how I look at it I have very similar problems with kids piecing together stuff and thinking that it's great. Especially in GarageBand where you have all these amazing samples made by other people. They put them together and make a song and think they're geniuses and you have to begin to explain to them that there's more to it and, and that's not, you know, you're not the next like, you know, genius remixer because you've done that. So yeah, I'm I'm wondering if there's a place to have that conversation at Educon too. 
around the stuff we produce. <laughs> right. But yeah. yeah. Worth, worth Actually, it, 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 if I remix anything for George and Harry session, it will be self evidently mediocre. <laughs> Well, I don't think you, I don't think you should just assume that though. I mean, we're our, we're our own worst critics, right? So he's just gonna under promise and over deliver. I know, guys. Like... <laughs> but but Paul, you um, I mean, I I guess on the this just seems like one of those kind of things where we're we're gonna set the structure up and we're just gonna see what happens. We're we're hoping that we're gonna we're gonna make these little cards, um, that are, that we're we were gonna see we could kind of hand out. Um, to people and just really basic directions, you know, like if you want to participate, these are this is how. And I mean, it could potentially. I mean, it could be could be pretty fun if if we get some buy-in and people start to kind of kick some of this media around. It could be interesting to see how people regard, you know, put put some of these things together. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm fascinated with how words mix together differently than. Audio and as when you were talking about the audio, I was thinking video mixes differently than audio too, right? You can, you have more flexibility, so the different media mixes differently is interesting to think about as well. We, we were going to try to get a list of um, somehow get a list of of, of user generated new tools. I know there's one thing that I've been seeing uh, poking around called popcorn. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a new yeah. thing. I, I haven't messed with it, but it seems like and, there's well, got to be some well, other really cool tools. Mozilla's going to be there for, uh, talking about that. So, huh. yeah. Oh, d d they're going to be at Educon talking about popcorn? Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh -huh. so, so, yeah, so that, that, that'd be fun to see, see what all these mixers can happen. Um, I, I guess we, we should get around to uh, last thoughts, if we can go around. And uh, we're going to start with Kelsey and Scott. You guys have any thoughts you want to share with us? This is really off topic. <laughs> but, you know, you've met me. I do that a lot. <laughs> I've been thinking about, like, getting into things like Monica's Thursday show, finding other Google Hangouts, Skype, called just other things to get out and talk to other people in other places. And I don't know where to look for those or where to start. Ah, that's a great question. Hmm. You could just start your own talk show. I mean, I know they have these places and invite guests just like, uh, <laughs> just like he does. And you could curate your own show on your own topics. How would I yeah. get it out there, though? Like... Yeah, actually, what, one one thing you might want to check out is an ongoing radio program. Um, it's kind of like it's almost like an online radio program slash this randomly awesome thought experiment called DS One Hundred Six. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. And, sorry, and 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 Kelsey, one of one of the one of the things you should do probably is 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 uh, look for. I'll send I'll send you a link to it, but uh, or your dad a link to it. But the um, Karen Fassenpower is doing a, a sort of eight-week session that's just starting, um, and DS106 is part of that. Um, so you could sign up for that, and uh, that would be a way to get some support and some, you know, getting out there. But I, but I, I love the idea of your your joining Christian on Thursday too. That's uh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate your hanging in there with this kind of. Bill got us started really fast there, but <laughs> you, you helped us. That's good. Scott, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I like the gen general concept of what we've been talking about tonight. But again, it's a uh, bleeding edge, really neat stuff. But we're <laughs> preaching to the choir. How are we going to get the rank and file teaching out of the teachers' edition? Still using chalkboard people to buy into this. I. I worry it's it's a big step. I, I wish you well, but I, I can see a big hurdle. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's okay. You know, we can keep messing. Monica, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'll follow that up with um, the more that we can play in the sandbox and not die and have fun. That's that's how we'll get them. <laughs> if I say go for it, have a blast, you guys. <laughs> Yep. Harry, 
Nice uh, to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you too. Fact. The only thing that I wanted to talk about, which I didn't, was that this is also an idea of just participatory journalism. Like kids and teachers just getting the idea that they can participate in creating content and, and being a part of storytelling. And, and that's the one angle that I forgot to kind of bring in. That, that's what we're encouraging all kids and people to have that point of view. Cool. And, and, and I'll jump back, back and forth a little bit here. And I've been thinking uh, a few times tonight, is this about creating new stuff or is it about curating things that exist already? And it's both, right? And it's kind of messing with the line between those things, I guess. But that's one thought. George, thank you for um, inviting us all into this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about the mix-up in the beginning. I'm not sure what was going on. But what, what I like about this is something that I like sometimes in, in the classroom when you start projects and you're not really quite sure where they're going to lead you to, you know. And so I, I think this is kind of a fun thing where we're going to do our best to set up a structure that we think will work. And we're not going to overthink it like Bill said not to do. Um, and we're just going to kind of see what the hell happens, and, you know. I mean, I think the potential is there for some cool stuff. And if it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, I think it's just kind of, I think Harry and I are um, genuinely interested in kind of what, what might go on. And, and I think that it's kind of an experiment for, for, for me. There's ways that I could see using this in the classroom. The idea of going out and doing something and having everyone send content with their phones, you know, to some place that they can later use to kind of, you know, make some meaning out of what we had all just experienced, um, I think is potentially a powerful thing to, to do in your classroom with your kids. And so this is kind of a good way of kind of working out some of the possible kinks and seeing, um, you know, how this would, or if it would work, or how it would work. And, and I, I feel like it, it would work. I, mean, I know the tools are there, and I know that, you know, if people have access to this stuff and they're really into what they're, to whatever it is that ex the experience was, it just seems like it, it's kind of a, it seems like something that would sort of naturally go together well. So it'll just be interesting to see what happens. So, and thanks very much, Paul, for, for letting us pitch it on the show tonight. Cool. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And Bill, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, just in, uh, George. Also, yeah, thanks for kind of um, kind of reaching out to Paul on this one, and for including me in that initial thing. And Paul, as always, it's great to uh, great to talk with you and um, and Harry, Monica, Kelsey, and uh, and Scott. Uh, good to uh, meet you virtually as well. Um, but uh, I mean, I. And Scott, this kind of gets at one of the things you were saying, like you were talking about, you know, how do we get this into kind of the hands of the teachers who are, again, you know, still still teaching from the uh, from the textbook, from the manual, and, you know, just really doing things, you know, the same way they've been doing them for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Honestly, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a goal, because <laughs> there are, there are people who aren't going to change. And there are people who are, and if we can if we can model different ways of achieving something worthwhile and something valuable, and articulate why it's worthwhile and valuable, that's what success looks like. And we need to really just kind of maintain the inertia to keep moving that forward. And again, it's not going to happen quickly. It's not going to happen immediately, and it's probably not going to happen system wide. I mean, even people, again, like the Broad Foundation, like Walton, like Gates, who have a lot of money, who are trying to make these enormous changes happen in education, they're not making enormous changes happen in education. They're chipping away at it. There's definitely, like, a concerted, you know, things are happening there. But system-wide change is very difficult to accomplish. And that's why I think having isolated corners of excellence and innovation and articulating what's great about them is, I think, an awesome an awesome starting point. And looking to benefit as many ways as possible within that. That's cool. Go ahead, Bill. Are you finished or? No, oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So I, I, I'll just say that uh, I think there must be something in the air. When when pop, when you mentioned popcorn and I realized Mozilla's going to be there, 
talked about their stuff, and you, Bill, and Harry, and George, um, there definitely seems to be something in the air, and Remix is a nice kind of theme to kind of jump into Educon with. So thank you all for uh, bringing that up and uh, sharing some of the ideas. Um, and we want to say that uh, we we um, have been broadcasting here at, over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network, and thanks to Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier for all of um, that community building that they've done. Um, and we'll see you again um, next week. Talk to you all. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night.